before I um, uh, introduce you, I would like to invite uh, Dean Tam to um, just shortly just welcome you know our uh, our guests and uh, and the attendance for the uh, 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 lecture today. Yeah. So on behalf of the school, I would like to welcome all participants to this uh, public lecture. Uh, about 10 years ago, I read a book related to this topic, that is London as a creative city. And um, that I think is a very important topic, not only in relation to uh, culture, uh, but also to business. As we all know, creative culture is also business. It's very, a very important aspect of the new culture that is being developed in most of the, what we call creative cities in the world. And London is a very good example of the creative city. And I know that there are many PhD theses that have been written on this aspect. Um, with London as an example. So um, today we are very lucky to have Professor Landry to give us a lecture on the creative city after the pandemic. And let's welcome Professor Landry. Thank you, Professor Tam. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Tam. Now, um, Charles Landry is a name that I do not need to uh, 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 elaborate and introduce. He's a, a well-known figure, uh, internationally uh, known, uh, now as the father of the creative city. And um, uh, I think uh, um, he worked uh, in the early years with Law Skidelsky. Maybe I'll leave that actually for Charles to, to introduce uh, this figure. Um, on the idea of the post-industrial society. And uh, I think from that uh, early work that he gradually developed you know, his own concepts and ideas uh, on the creative city uh, since the 1980s. And he has written um, profusely actually on the subject. In fact, uh, uh, employing uh, different uh, disciplinary uh, knowledge and skills, including you know psychology, uh, and uh, and other policy uh, studies, uh, in developing you know his thesis, and um, and ever since he, he published you know the the book on uh, the creative city, the toolkit for making the creative city, that actually became a driver for international movement. Uh, in fact. Uh, uh, all over the world uh, in emulating this concept. And he has been actually acting as advisor to different governments uh, on how to make their cities creative. My very first encounter with Charles dated actually back to this uh, era, which was uh, the early 2000s, when he was invited by the Hong Kong government. And at that time, there was a central policy unit um, I thought it was uh, headed by Professor Lao Siu Kai at that time. And uh, he was invited uh, to come and uh, deliver a speech to uh, a group of VIPs. I think some of them, most of them actually the senior officials uh, on the concept. And it was in fact, uh, my involvement in this area with the creative industries, uh, by producing the first uh, commission study on uh, the baseline study of the Hong Kong's creative industries in the year 2000 and published actually in the year 2002 and three, yeah. And then ever since uh, uh, we met each other very frequently on international meetings and, um, and, and we have actually been uh, 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 in good uh, relation and friendship uh, since the 2000s, uh, including very recently his invitation for me to take part in his uh, study for the UN Habitat uh, 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 study and one particular chapter on Shenzhen, uh, which I uh, work on. 
and really look forward to seeing the outcome. Uh, but today, uh, he has kindly agreed to give a very timely uh, lecture on the subject of the post-pandemic creative city. So it's almost like, you know, putting his life work to the test of this very threatening uh, 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 virus. <laughs> and again, we look forward to his wisdom and his insights on what we should do to keep up the creativity in our cities. So without more ado, let's give a big applause to uh, uh, Charles. Yeah, thank you. All over to thank you. Thank you Charles. very much, um, Desmond, for inviting me. And it's a real privilege to be with you. Um, I wish I was in Hong Kong, obviously. Um, so I'm going to take a little journey, if you don't mind, from the beginnings of this idea to where we might go to now. And I thought Desmond's suggested title, A Post-Pandemic Creative City, was really wonderful. And I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, so if you don't mind, I, I will go through this little story and start from the beginning. So A Post-Pandemic Creative City. This all started somewhere, as Desmond highlighted, and there are many questions around this, of course. And I suppose just a reminder, in the past, there were very cultural creative cities. This is a picture of Siena. Of course, it was creative. I suppose the key point and the novelty is that at some point, 30, 40 years ago, cities and we and many of you participated in this, thought of how do you become and be self-consciously a creative city before people didn't use necessarily in the 16th century the creative city, but in many ways they were creative because cities are mostly the laboratories for providing the solutions of the problems they create and of course the opportunities too. And creativity matters, and it's, of course, context driven. If we think of pandemics and things like that, but also illnesses, cholera, solving the cholera in the 19th century was really an incredibly creative act by a number of scientists. So what creativity is in various periods or the focus and priority is likely to differ. In our beginning, the beginning in Europe, these were the conditions we found. Houses boarded up, industries declining. This is Glasgow. They don't build ships there anymore. This was the sort of result, you know, great poverty. Um, this is another city. This is Liverpool at that time. This is, again, Liverpool. Um, again, boarded up places. And so on and so on. So you know all about that. And of course, this was all to do with the movement towards China in terms of the dramatic restructuring that happened in Europe at the time. So everything was going down. Jobs were going down. Income was going down. Confidence was going down. And people began to ask themselves, well, what have I got when everything seems to be disappearing from my eyes? businesses going out of obviously uh, declining and many people of course leaving all of these cities the population of Glasgow halved in 30 years the same in the case of Liverpool I'm just giving those two examples so the question was always how can we attract those people who are leaving to come back in some sort of way and this, of course, was also a big psychological question for all sorts of cities, because they had to ask themselves a very simple question. Who am I? What's my identity? What have I got? What are my resources? And so on. So there had to be a different idea, a different plan. Call it a plan B, if you wish. And 
So what people began to ask, or I asked myself, is how do you create the conditions for people to think, plan, and act with imagination to solve the problems they were facing and to create the opportunities to revitalize themselves? So what are our resources, one asked. Now, I'm being very simplistic. Clearly, all of you as specialists know that culture is who we are. You know, there's the big definition of culture, way of life, etc. But it is essentially who we are, our habits and mindset and so on. And creativity is really what we can become, or it helps us become something afresh, obviously based on our culture mostly. And initially, the focus was on arts and culture because culture in the narrower sense, because art, as we all know, every society creates art, rituals and all of that, is one of the supreme expressions of who we are and what our culture is. And so therefore it was very much an important focus in order to build up long-term confidence. I remember a study I did in Glasgow called The Creative City and Its Creative Economy in 1989. And it was really uh, this focus. And it was a wonderful piece of work for me because the Glaswegians, they're so intelligent and they were so difficult and they were so demanding. And I loved it. And we developed a methodology, which was the value chain uh, methodology, which is essentially about how do you generate ideas and how do they get implemented and so on. And clearly through time, as we all know, we recognize the impacts both direct of, of art and culture and its indirect effects in terms of spillovers and spin-offs and so on. We all know about the symbolic effects of having a rich, vibrant life on how then the city is projected onto the global radar screen. And all of these sectors initially, they were at that time all looked at separately. Oh, this is one sector, this is performance, this is writing. And what the key thing was that we did at the time was to try, and others were doing this as well, of course, to bring them together. So instead of seeing these as little fragments, you suddenly saw them as a comprehensive sort of ecosystem where graphics linked to design, linked to performance and so on. And suddenly the sector was seen as very big. And a symbolic moment in Britain was at the time when they realized that the exports of the music industry was greater than the exports of the car industry. So you can imagine people began to take notice. So seeing these things together made us see, all of us, that this is a sector in its own right. And obviously Desmond has done masses of studies on uh, showing how this happens. And of course, what then happened recently in the pandemic era, of course, that sector suffered more than any other sector, perhaps, because so much of it is to do with public performance and things of that nature. So I don't need to remind you what that sort of stuff is. You know, it's having events in old buildings sometimes. It's circus, that woman there floating in the sky is my daughter, anyway. Um, but all of these sort of things, these pictures are just a reminder of the scope of the activities that one was talking about at that time. And of course, it remains ever important. And this is uh, one of the major uh, in Vienna, uh, not in Vienna, in Graz, uh, a, a virtual reality uh, uh, studio. And obviously the link between all of those traditional sectors with digitization has created something dramatic. But it is also stuff like here, this is the biggest foundry in Britain, creating massive public artworks and so on. But it's also just people doing public art. You know, near me, this is near my town, 
there is an artist who every few weeks puts a new thing up so the so people can see it when they drive by he changed lockdown to lockdown anyway i'm just reminding us of its scope and within this of course urban regeneration happened this is the old warehouses in liverpool they then get transformed into museums. I don't particularly like that new museum that's in the middle there uh, in front of that white building. I don't like its look. I'm, I love new architecture, but I don't happen to like that piece of architecture there. Um, but it also reminded people that the way artists operate is very much prefiguring the future. We know that when you're creating a film or you're creating a theatre piece or something like that, that there are very many ingredients that need to come together in various forms. Secondly, we also recognise that those people operate as portfolio workers, sometimes on one project, another time on another. And so this is a Swedish in, in Helsingborg in Sweden. I just happened to see it. it says chaos room. Now, it isn't really chaos they're trying to create there. They're trying to bring all these elements together to create a product. Um, so can someone turn their noise off, please? Can someone Thank you. Um, so what then continued uh, was, of course, uh, that people began to sort of try and set up also co-working spaces. And some of these were in places like this, which is an old church. Um, or in contrast, of course, to the sort of buildings that were built everywhere, you know, the sort of skyscrapers we see everywhere. So you're getting an aesthetic which is slightly different from the aesthetic that was happening in city development. This is not Hong Kong, so don't worry. Um, but also we now find that the sort of images that we had of co-working are also being taken up by traditional companies in all sorts of ways. But as you know, it's not only arts and culture. Arts and culture are incredibly important, but there's always a bigger story. And for me, the bigger story is how do you develop a comprehensive culture of creativity? And that means thinking of social innovation, scientific innovation, business innovations, and also bureaucratic innovations and creativities. Because if you look at a city, it's really obviously an ecosystem. And all of these forms need to, in the best world, come together. A link between a social innovation and a cultural innovation may be very interesting. Linking uh, artistic thinking with scientific uh, thinking together often brings an incredible, interesting set of innovations. So what we're really talking about is that the creative city connects this triad, culture, creativity and the city, in exploring how places can navigate the waves of urban transformation. And the idea is really trying to shift the paradigm a bit and really saying, which is why I talked about ecosystem, how do you harness the collective imagination of a place, which is what I mean by a culture of creativity? And from my perspective, this idea is an empowering ethos. Now, not everybody is as creative as everybody else, but we can all be more imaginative or open ourselves out uh, than we were before. And I personally believe and this was an inspiration, by the way, of the whole creative city idea in my personal history, is that ordinary people can make the extraordinary happen if given a chance. And just a tiny detour, the reason I got interested in creativity is that I kept on meeting people who I thought were incredibly interesting, but didn't find ways of expressing themselves. I could have focused on that. I could have focused on organizational creativity. 
why I was interested in the creative city is because lots of organizations, people, different cultures are coming together. And for me, the interesting task was how that can be brought together in a vision or an ambition and so on. And of course, that is complex, as you know. Now, a few years back, about 10, 12 years ago, I realized I should have started at another place. I should have thought of how do you generate in a place curiosity? I was in a northern British city which was very declining and people were saying to someone whose parents were unemployed, they were unemployed, why don't you be a bit more entrepreneurial? And then I thought, oh my God, that's not gonna happen unless we generate curiosity in them. Now, as you well know, young people are often into music and then we developed a music strategy there to encourage young people to get involved in music. Not that they were going to become a star, but because they would learn technologies and things like that, that they could apply in different sectors. Now, if we are curious, then we might be imaginative. And if we're imaginative, we might have then creative ideas. One or two of them might be an invention. That then might lead to an innovation when it's widespread. And that then creates that cycle. So this cycle of creativity, is for me something that I think is quite important. Now, obviously, when you're thinking about this, you have to think of the different qualities of creativity of an individual, an organization, and so on. So in an organization, you want to blend people together so they work together. So the way creativity works there, because we're thinking about teams, is quite different from just an individual doing their thing then I think it's useful to think, well, how does that work in a system where lots of organizations and individuals are there? And then, of course, the city and the state, a country and so on. Now, some of the essences of all of this is really a key feature everywhere in this discussion about innovation and these topics is openness is key, being more open than closed a willingness to reassess things. Now, very often a creative thing may be to leave something as it is, which is why it's quite creative to save heritage sometimes. But nevertheless, you should reassess whether something is working or not working. And also, I suppose, applying what I'm calling here the what if logic. So what if we did that? What if we did this? And then trying to find the connections and the patterns between all of these things that are revealing themselves. And then what's very important is to have a balance between the divergent thinking, you know, opening out imagination. And then, of course, creativity is only really creativity when it turns into reality. So we need to then at some point say, well, how does this go through the reality checker, which is convergent thinking? Now, seen this way, I think creativity is a form of capital, a currency, you could call it, and it's, it could be infinite and endless. So it's a resource, obviously, it's an asset in some way, a potential and an opportunity. It's also, I think, when it's unleashed and there's openness in a place, it generates energy and is rather like a motor, and then, of course, can become a trigger and a catalyst. Now, if you look at um, dynamics, and I'm not going to talk about this so much, but you can define cities as city 1.0, which was a certain way of operating a city, rather top down, perhaps it's the industrial city, you know, things don't really connect very well. It's very functionally divided, industrial zones, living zones, and all of that. Then if you think of a city 2.0, which might have happened 30, 40 years ago, people begin to think of images and the symbols of the city. How does it reflect itself? And you then get obviously lots of star architects trying to build the most amazing building ever. 
as we know, we don't remember that many buildings around the world, but nevertheless, there's a greater focus on urban design, physical connectivity and so on. And the City 3.0 is perhaps one that brings all of these things together, the 1.0, 2.0, and is very much about how it, you can and be enabled to co-create and shape and co the evolving city. And that looks obviously different. And that's more top down and bottom up. You might want a big project that's driven by the public sector, but it's also unleashing a lot of the civic creativity that often solves problems, does interesting things and so on. So that's about that whole notion of shaping, making, co-creating the evolving city. Now, if I'm doing this sort of work just personally, what we do is we look at then an asset in terms of the resources, which could be heritage, which could be interesting things that, that a city does, something that's distinctive. But we also look at the obstacle audit. What are the obstacles to that? Because overcoming an obstacle is also a creative act. The other thing we always are thinking about, what is the organizational mechanism that helps drive that? And often these are intermediary mechanisms that might be within the public sector that are connecting people, helping people go to market and all of those sorts of activities, obviously funding regimes and so on. And then again, one has to look at how do you generate critical mass and are able to scale up. And particularly it's important to think of hardware and software, and if you like the word orgware, together. Because to make a place work is about soft features, the activities perhaps people do and all of that, as well as the physical conditions. And the key aspect is are the physical conditions creating the opportunity uh, to, to be better, more imaginative and so on. And obviously that often makes making the invisible visible. So if you want to say I'm a creative place, somehow that needs to be seen in the physical environment. So, or symbolically in some way, often there's an incredibly creative stuff happening in a building, but you, you wouldn't know it on the street. So basically you can see here, we're talking about tangible material things and intangible things. And over the last 30 years, clearly many places have moved from, you know, not being very interesting to rather interesting. And I suppose the two key points are you're shifting from a density of resources to a density of networks and circuits or proximity to resources like coal or whatever it is you're mining and substituting that to proximity of knowledge, which is, of course, why we try to cluster interesting people together in various ways. So successful creative city making, usually there's an ambition. Uh, and I wrote a little book and it was said called The City of Ambition. It's not OK to be OK. So that city needs to recognize that. They have then obviously sophisticated learning systems. They're fostering crossovers. They're orchestrating and orchestration is a key thing to orchestrate this hardware, software, all these elements together uh, in a light touch way. And there you get this ecosystem of creativity. So in short, I'm just summarizing, the priorities have changed from the eighties the ones now are different, but the cultural focus is still important because to really understand a place, you have to know its history, its DNA, its culture, how that's expressed. And from that, one can generate um, uh, potential. But now, of course, creative action is about, you know, fostering, for example, the sustainability goals of the UN. So it's very much beyond the self. What are we doing for the, our wider world? And just before I move on, there are some dilemmas and a paradox, because at the moment, lots of people talk about creativity, but there's a massive risk culture going on. And these, you know, sort of negate each other. 
And we really need to also ask the question, is it only the creative economy that is creative or is it creativity in the economy, a change of word? And we often use the word cultural planning and I think I made a mistake. It should have been called planning culturally, i.e. planning with an understanding of the culture because when you say cultural planning, it seems to make us imply, oh, I'm only going to build a cultural building. The other dilemma, of course, is that so much of this revitalization that's happened through creatives has led to gentrification. And, but that wasn't, you know, its original aim. And what we're talking about is not only the hipsters, clearly. So with Bill Bauer about 15 years ago, they challenged us and said, could you measure the creativity of a city in all its dimensions? And so that's why I showed a picture of Bill Bauer. And we devised four sort of big clusters or domains. And the first, and what we analyze is how can you identify and nurture creativity? And there you assess things like level of openness, trust, participation, what the learning landscape is, formal and informal, how talent is developed. The second cluster of domains is about the enabling and supporting mechanisms, which is about the political and public framework, the leadership of the city, is there some sort of vision, agility and so on. And also importantly, do people in the city mean what they're saying? is their professionalism and effectiveness. The third domain that we explore is then how do you exploit and harness this, bring it together, which is of course about the innovation capacity, entrepreneurship, how connecting devices, networks, and all of that works, the media, all of that. And it's also of course to do with physical connectivity, you know, are you an airport hub? Have you got trains and all of that as well? And the final cluster, final domain is living and expressing it. Can you actually see it? Now, this is of course, can you see the diversity, the specialness, the vitality, the expressiveness of a city? What's the place like? What's it being created? Is the new stuff interesting or horrible? Have you got the facilities, livability, well-being? Have you got all of these things, parks, hospitals, all of that other stuff that is vital to make a city work? Now, we do this, and I'm not suggesting you do it, but just as an interesting exercise, it's not about what number you've got, but if you 10, you know, you're brilliant, you're amazing. If you're one, you're very bad. And the issue when we do this uh, is simply to say, oh, if you're a five, you're average, what do you need to do to become a six or a seven? And that becomes a very interesting strategy making tool because then you can actually define projects that need to be done. So where are we now? Where are we now? I mean, obviously everybody's thinking about the future. They were thinking about that before the pandemic. And what we're really thinking so much is about, you know, bringing nature back into the city, blending the physical and the natural together. So there's a lot of stuff going on, as we all know. And the big issue, the big issue, there are many big issues, is the need really to wake up. And this is not only in a pandemic sense, but really to see how can you harness the potential in a place. Now, of course, the current circumstances, climate issues and so on, and, you know, the movement of people around the world and, you know, disruptive political situations happening creates an incredible fragility in places. And particularly the crises that we're finding now, which are all coagulating together, the water crisis, the climate crisis, deforestation, you know, that many cities are inhuman, ugly, dysfunctional, really means that it's a bit like one minute to, to midnight. And I think most of us realize we're in the midst of a systemic crisis and a business as usual approach will not get us to where we need to be. And 
Earth Overshoot Day in 1919, uh, in, in uh, 19 was the 28th of, uh, uh, 29th of July. In 2000, it was the 23rd of September. So that's the day when we've used all the resources of the world. So that just tells you everything. Because we really, our way of life and economic order is materially expansive, socially divisive, and environmentally hostile. And that just is a cover of my book called The Civic City in a Nomadic World. And that line in the middle symbolically is the challenge to heal that crack in our evolving world. And I don't need to tell you about the great disruptor. That great disruptor was and is the immersive qualities of the digitizing world and the fourth industrial revolution and the way it has brought us in some senses much closer together and made the world a smaller place and created the opportunity to be here, there, simultaneously. And also the situation that you can't hide from big data, the dilemmas, we know that, the big my data movement, so that not people are knowing about all of your data, every move you're making. So there's an interesting obviously issues around privacy, as we all know. And that world can be sort of perhaps too much. You know, this is an exhibition in France, which is called Hyper Vital. And, you know, you might say to these Manchester City football players, hey, how about concentrating on the second half of the match rather than looking at your mobile? Anyway, you know all of that. And I'm only just playing around at the moment. And again, we know, again, some of the things that have happened with organisations like Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And what it's become, of course, and this is the positive and negative side of the social media, that it becomes a bit me, 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 rather than a real conversation. But at the same time, this capacity of all of that to enable sharing economies to happen, to do all sorts of things, to censorize the city in positive ways. Of course, we know that potential. And of course, the arts and uh, skills and talents within graphics and all of that are so embedded in the way that digitizing world works that it could have never reached its apex without those original cultural and artistic skills. And of course, it's made the city feel completely different. You know, many people working in cafes and all of that, et cetera, et cetera. So what we still have, though, and what remains is how do you create zones of encounter in a world of social uh, distancing? And how do you create places of empathy in that? This, as you know, is in Chicago, Millennium Park and is a wonderful uh, area where people do connect. So those are some of the questions. What are the, this is Station F in Paris. So these are perhaps the new incubator hubs of a world of social uh, distancing. Now, one thing that lots of people talk about, as we know, is create cultural districts. Again, how relevant are they? And this we'll just explore for a few moments because you want to cluster often, but you also want the whole city to be creative. Now, cultural districts can just be organic, they just happen. And then you might say, well, what is a cultural district? Well, a cultural district is often a place where there are often also cultural facilities, of course, but there's also other activities going on. They're just em uh, emergent and organic. Sometimes people try to create cultural districts and plan them from the top. Other times they're driven by activists. And sometimes people just market a district as cultural when it's not cultural or creative at all. And, but when we think about that, this is quite interesting. Where do you start? And this links to what I've said before. Do you start with just a building? And I know Desmond did some interesting stuff in Hong Kong about making interesting buildings. Is that enough? Or is it a collection of buildings? And often it is. Or is it a street, an interesting street, which then spills out into the neighbourhood? 
And is it then the cultural district, the city as a whole? Now, there are different purposes in this whole development. Sometimes they've been specifically physical, you know, to try to get attention via the creative community. Some of these buildings may be new or old. Other times it, the purpose has been economic, job creation. Other times some increasingly cultural districts are trying to blend uh, social with economic issues. And many of you will know, of course, the Global Cultural Districts Network. Look at that, very interesting, uh, and particularly their monthly reports. So some of the dilemmas here are, of course, that people are using, let's say a property developer who's not very creative, but uses the creative community for their own marketing purposes. And then the other issues is, do you keep the creative pulse by really engaging with the locals? And how can you avoid uh, uh, the gentrification dynamic in such a way that those who generate the energy are not pushed out? So that city 3.0 that I talked about would have dealt with some of these things. Its look and feel would be different. It would be about public space, convenient. It would obviously use digitization well. And it would obviously create many places for chance encounter. Now, one of the first cultural districts named this way in the modern era was Birmingham. And this is the custard factory and nearby is something called the peg. And in there are just clustered all the sort of people within the creative economy sectors. Um, of course, this is San Francisco that initially was also one of these places. This is Castro there. It's of course now more a tourism hotspot. But then another one is Nantes, you know, where those vast elephants are made. And what's interesting about that Ile de Nantes, which was the old factory shipbuilding area, is it's connected, which you can see in that building behind it, to a university which focuses on design, art, performance, music and so on. So there's an interesting combination. You can't see this at the moment, some old warehouses and very new buildings. Another example, which I think is good, and I know Hong Kong is so massively big, but this is one of the best examples in Europe, which is Mannheim, industrial city near Heidelberg. And they have, and you can see these German words, their strategy is all based about, can you see networking, integration, inspiration, uh, participation, obviously culture and innovation, you can see those words. And the whole area, there's a whole area they've developed called Jungbusch, which, as it says, Kamas you are. And this doesn't look very interesting, perhaps, but that's a music park inside there where vast clusters of music entities exist that has then spread up the street. And these all along this river, it's getting more and more developed. And then they have these hubs. This is another incubation hub, the sea hub. But most importantly, they've got an educational institution there, the Pop Academy, which is run by a business person from Sony, was initially, and a musician together. So not surprisingly, because of that training, the students uh, all seem to get a job. So this is a pretty unique place in Europe, at least, where that link between business and learning creativity is done together. So you see all these words there, which, which is just a nice, interesting example. I'll go to another extreme, and I'm always aware we're talking to Hong Kong, which is one of the most interesting places, I think. It's called Favara, F-A-V-A-R-A. -A -A. And it's called Farm Cultural Park. And they have over time, and it's won lots of prizes, completely transformed this place which was declining through art and, but it's participation, lots of other things that are going on in the city, which is, you know, led to, there were, let's say, a thousand visitors a year, now a hundred thousand, you know, and obviously a whole economy has developed on the basis of that. But sometimes doing the thing that is creative is being a bit in unconventional. 
NDSM is a vast place in Amsterdam. And the developers said to the, uh, the owners said to the developers, make it feel like this. Now, I'm not saying that they built this, but I'm just giving you an idea that sometimes developing things in traditional ways is not the way forward. Now, of course, you know, your painting village in Shenzhen, which Desmond and we both discussed, you could say that's another version of that, or here, revitalizing the city through the lanes in, 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 in Melbourne, or here in Berlin, a shopping center that's declining, putting a club on the top of it, led to this shopping center being completely revitalized. So you get the idea. So I'll talk a bit about Berlin. You can see this old building that was squatted, which was a real hub of Berlin creativity initially, but it looks completely mad. Over time, it became not so good and was a bit too much and lost all its um, power. But the point was that some strange things happened there, which put the spotlight on Berlin. Now, I'm not telling anyone that you should do all this at all, but I'm just trying to create this contrast. And recently it was bought by a major Swedish developer. And here that the developers coming in to launch his plans and the contrast between the champagne that's being served and the graffiti is quite interesting. So they're building there, but what they're building is this. So can't we somehow make the new buildings have some small element of that verve and vigor of the old in it rather than this, which is very bland. I'm gonna show you another crazy one, which is called Holzmarkt. And these, uh, a foundation, this was a nightclub area on the river and all along the river, they're building skyscrapers, but a big, insurance company, Swiss insurance company, allowed this cooperative group to buy 250 meters of the river. And what you see here are these buildings are kindergartens and lots of things like that, which is all very socially useful stuff. And it's actually just again reminds us, and that's what I'm trying to do here, is there are different ways of developing a place that is a bit more human scale and so on. So these are just different images of that same place. So here again, you, you get the idea. It's on the river. It's of course, incredibly popular. This is gonna be financed by this building at the end, which is gonna be one of the biggest wood buildings in Europe. So there's an interesting economic model taking place there. So this is Dafen. I, Thought I'd just put that in just because we're near there. Um, I don't know how good it is, actually. I know it's one of the biggest producers of art in the world. So the big question is, what is the role in this transformation that we need to uh, take place, which I think needs to be ethical in some way. It needs some purpose and so on. And I'm saying really the priority is to focus on the issues that really matter. And the issues that really matter have to be effectively global solutions. And there is a, an annual event in Amsterdam called We Make the City. And I think it's quite inspiring because it brings together for a week all sorts of new ways of solving urban problems. And you can see in the background all the right words, you know, let's make it inclusive, more smart, climate proof and so on. And the issue really, I think, for city strategy makers is to somehow combine these different forms of energy that people have from young people and old people together in one way or another. And one slogan I like is really, if you're going to be a creative city, be the best creative city for the world rather than the best creative city in the world, so that this global responsibility takes place and I think from an image perspective that will give much more resonance to the city 
and just this, this picture should have been somewhere else on gentrification. This is Zurich, where they put all the trendy things and, you know, Amazons and all of that in this area. And there was a new hotel called Renaissance and someone, an artist who didn't let his building be knocked down, put resistance. So this process of urban development has tensions and that's at some level the beauty because we've got to solve those tensions. And I live in a very small place called Stroud and a lot of things that are happening in many places are about the local stuff that you are doing. So there's always this balance between the global and the local. Now, I'm just going to slowly uh, end up. I was asked to do an exhibition in that place I mentioned, Favara, uh, called The Art of City Making. And I then, they said, summarize very briefly everything that you think. So I basically, had these five these various rooms and I said great places are places of anchorage anchorage tradition heritage I know the what is familiar and what is distinctively me my originality my stuff my life uh, this is a picture of Jodhpur that's very distinctive it's the blue city you know I'm just using that as an example uh, this is Kolkata, uh, the area where they make all those idols which go all around the world and go down the Ganges. So that's distinctive. But actually, these are a collection of photos I took of tourist buses. They all are owned by the same company. And it says things like Sydney, Florence, London, Madrid, whatever. So that's not really that distinctive. Nor is that my collection of Coca-Cola. I think the uh, actual, the icon of Coca-Cola is very uh, attractive. But, you know, in some places, that's all you see. You don't see the distinctive. The second big theme I had was a place of connection and communication. That one is connected. I've already made that point before. And finding urban environments beyond obviously physical connection, you know, trams, trains and all of that, but also other forms of connecting that people have some sort of chance encounter in unusual contexts, or it could be here. This was me. I was sitting in a cafe in Tirana for three hours and just took hundreds of photos of people walking by, but it's just a, an image to describe connection. The third big theme was a place of opportunity and ambition where people can become the best they can be, where you've got all sorts of obviously learning structures, formal and informal, to make people or provide people with the opportunity to do great stuff. Now, places of ambition may be just ambitious buildings and all of that. And from my talk, you realize that I'm talking about more than just buildings and so on. But perhaps providing the physical and urban design conditions for people to give of their best. The fourth big theme was great places, great creative places are places of nurture. They nurture you and nourish you. So they nourish you by a spirit of generosity that the city gives back to you. A great park, a great public space is like a gift. And that gift makes you feel good and makes you also give back. But nurture and nourishment is obviously all the facilities that sustain life as well. Great markets, not only mega shopping centers, sort of places where people can bring their food but also nurture and nourishment is the opposite, really finding great ways to get rid of waste in completely sustainable ways. And finally, great places are essentially places that provide inspiration and imagination. For many people historically and to still today, inspiration is let's say spiritual or religious or something like that. But inspiration, as you well know, people sometimes say museums are the cathedrals of the post-industrial age, could be uh, a wonderful art gallery experience or, 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 or something of that nature. So it could be, as I said, a religious thing, but it could be 
lots of other things that inspire you. Now, it might not be like this collection of graffitis here, it may certainly not inspire you. So perhaps I should have created a different image for that. But all of this comes back to, it, for me at least, the public administration. And Desmond knows that we run a festival called the Creative Bureaucracy Festival, which is where we're trying to highlight all the unsung heroes that exist and trying to show that there are solutions. We don't need to operate in silos because implied by everything I've said is that we need to be working together across departments, the social, the cultural, the economic, the urban design, the physical, the transport. Only then can we make, I think, great cities. And often that requires rethinking the rules and incentives and the regulation systems. So this is what this creative bureaucracy is about. And it's about really highlighting also the unsung heroes because you've got great people working in the public sector. And by the way, you university people are a public sector employees as well, aren't you? So, you know, there's a lot of talent there, but often the structures don't allow people to fulfill their best. And to some extent, this idea of rethinking how the rules and regulations work had become a big of a bit of a movement. This was a picture from the first conference we had. A thousand five hundred people came. It was in Berlin, 2018. This is 2019. Um, everybody gets their bureaucrat scarf. Uh, and the last two years have, of course, been virtual. So it is about these young people. So there we are. This young girl has got a creative bureaucrat scarf on and that's where I'll leave you. So thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Thank you, Charles. Now, I think we, um... In the room, you know, we have um, around 50 plus uh, um, students and staff and guests. And then also online, I think we have 80. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, quite a turnout actually for your talk today. And I'm sure actually has uh, excited uh, many minds uh, sitting around and listening. So uh, we'll have a uh, half an hour uh, Q&A session and it's a opportunity actually for us to interact with uh, Charles Landry. So um, let's see um, whether we have any questions. Now, maybe I start off with my first question. Um, uh, as we look at the uh, topic today, which is the post pandemic creative city, and you mentioned, of course, you know, many uh, issues already, uh, the, the big disruptor, and then, you know, all the um, 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 current uh, um, issues that you believe are uh, still relevant and important uh, in, in the future. But among all these, you know, which one you think is the most important and the most uh, concerning? Well, I, I think one has to say, obviously, the climate collapse question. Um, I mean, recently, I don't know what the situation is in Hong Kong, but there were sort of vast floods in Germany that I haven't seen for 100 years and things like that. And what going back to where we started, you know, the talents that exist within what we define as the creative cultural economy, I think there are so many innovations to be made that can, which are really driven and helped by those people in those sectors. I mean, if you just think of how you monitor some of this stuff, it involves visualization, um, really the whole sensorizing the city things, you know, IoT, Internet of Things, all of some of those things, all can be really accelerated by the talents that exist in that sector. So for me, 
it's dealing with those climate related issues because that's then interconnected because it then connects to deforestation, um, you know, water issues and so on. I think the other one uh, is, is really this question of diversity because in a nomadic world, you know, when so many different cultures come together, when countries or cities feel under threat, you always then say, hey, who's this other person who doesn't really belong here? And you probably know, I know you know, Desmond, we wrote, a, had a long study called the Intercultural City, planning for the diversity dividend and really working out how one can see that as a dividend rather than only as a problem. Now, obviously, integrating different people from different backgrounds can be a bit complex, but at the same time, it can be a source of, of, of potential. The third big challenge is really to do with how our mind works. And quite often I talk about mind flow, mindset and mind shift. Now, obviously, you know, the mind flow is, you know, just how we operate because we don't want to rethink things every minute of the day would go mad. Uh, mindset is sort of, you know, our, our, our values, our prejudices, what we believe and all of that. But the mind shift that is really required, I believe, is this integrated thinking, understanding different disciplines. Now, You've got some architects in there and other people in your room, I believe. I don't need to understand the details of architecture, but I need to know the essence of what it's all about, just like I need to know the essence of finance, the essence of really different subjects. So I'm not against the specialist at all, but that integrated mind to see the interconnections, to understand it, unless we do that, we won't generate the motivation to act. So it's three things, climate collapse, the diversity agenda, and thinking in an integrated way. Okay, we have the first uh, question from uh, the audience, uh, our Professor Pam. Hi, Professor Landry. I would like to ask more about uh, the point that you made about planning culturally. So uh, I want to uh, understand more about this term. Uh, in relation to this, I, I would like to uh, make a few points about, for example, when you go to the 7,000 London, we will think of Charles Dickens, the scenes described in his novels. And that would also bring us to the films made about the plays and also the novels. So that is not just what we see, but what we feel what we make connection with history. In, in the same case that we go to Madrid, we will, when we walk around the city, we will think of Don Quixote, the scenes described in Don Quixote. And then we also try to make connection between the present and the past and the history of several hundred years. So that's, that's very interesting. We, we seem to be brought back to the scene several hundred years ago, and then we understand the present in terms of the past. So, um, but this has to do with preservation and making known, making history known to the to the visitors. So, um, how how do we understand this in terms of your concept of planning culturally? Thank you. Uh, planning culturally is essentially being culturally literate. And what I mean by cultural literacy, I think cultural literacy is as important as numeracy and all the other forms of literacy. And when I first wrote about that, cultural literacy is understanding one's past, understanding where one comes from. That, that is what planning culturally is about understanding why people are as they are, why the place has formed as it is. So it's a combination of being understanding the past, the origins, because unless we go with the grain of a culture, in my view, people won't adapt to new circumstances. By going with the grain of who we are, 
and that is involves also the, the 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 comments you're making about heritage that that you won't have the confidence i think understanding one's past can give much more confidence that doesn't mean that everything in our past is wonderful but that's where one comes from so planning culturally has these other words in it behind it like cult being culturally literate and being culturally literate also means you know perhaps in an english context knowing what it was like when charles dickens was describing something and so on so you also link then better i think tradition with potential innovation now it's also for me completely not surprising that people who are trying to be uh, do interesting things often want to be in a work in old buildings and you know i know some of these buildings well had horrible conditions these old factories but why people like them is because you can feel the patina of the ages within the fabric of the building itself and that is inspiring so it all connects together the past the present and the future and that's what planning culturally means being sensitive to the totality of where we come from thank you charles there's there's a question online that there, which it says there is a culture that local people in hong kong like to draw pictures in walls corners in the urban in the urban area right do you agree this art especially whether you think art should be legally illustrated so really i think it's your comment on uh, graffiti yeah i mean it's about urban art obviously that question i mean the, the the origins of graffiti everybody in the room knows which is obviously the the gallery system of course hardly lets anyone who's an artist really it's only a very very few one in 150 or 300 people who get to show their art it was also obviously a form of protest and things like that uh, so we know all of that i mean you know obviously i get a bit irritated you come into a train station and there's all these tags everywhere and it all looks a complete mess but i think that in some ways um some of it is actually quite good i mean i was in a german city earlier this week and they had a whole area uh, in a skate park area where there were vast areas where people could just show their urban art so i think it's a balance it's not completely yes or completely no it's verging sometimes to the yes because you know many young people can't can't express themselves now i know you know it depends what they're saying on it i mean the one piece of graffiti i said one minute to midnight came from tel aviv i thought it was very good as the, the building was a horrible building and that was a nice little message the other one which said wake up was in in athens and i think we should wake up so it really depends what it is and there you get back to aesthetic judgments so it's an interesting question by the way Thank you. Now, let, uh, okay, Professor Tim again. What, what, role, what, role, what role does the government has in, um, in this uh, planning, in, uh, especially the point about cultural planning or planning culturally? Yeah, the, 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 of course, the government has an important role um, in, in, in a sense, trying to define the frame. I mean, the whole issues we've been discussing in the last hour, as I or hour and a bit, are all to do with, um, you know, providing a context, enabling conditions. So uh, sometimes I think uh, the government should act as an encourager as an encourager, as an enabler, as a facilitator, less than a controller. I mean, that's just now I may be a typical European, you know, you know, I'm a combination, by the way, of German, Italian and English. So, of course, that those traditions are in my mind. So 
for me, it's, it's providing opportunities and uh, uh, allowing people to un unleash their potential. Because I think that if you allow that, if, if you wanted to put this in terms of capital, you're releasing more capital. If you're allowing, I mean, Finland has only 5 million people. They're very open in this way because they've got to make the most of their 5 million people. Um, so the government has that role. Occasionally it's a leader. Sometimes it should be a follower and be influenced. So it should be more, uh, I suppose, flexible in that sense. Now, of course, it acts as a grant giver, uh, as a planner. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about here is creating physical environments that enable people to gather, connect and so on. A lot of that has to do with regulation. And I think, for example, in most cities, you know, the transport people have much more power than other people who I think should have more power um, uh, because the, the transport person says, I need 20 metres wide roads, whereas one might say, well, is that the best sort of road, the most human sort of road we can have? So, yeah, the government has a strong role, but it more in the direction of an enabling. Okay, um, a follow up in the uh, online. Do you think local government give enough uh, assistance or space for development? Um, does local government now? Th there's a big battle. I mean, Hong Kong is obviously more or less a city state, so it's slightly different. Uh, uh, there's a big battle. Uh, in Europe and beyond about the balance between the nation state and the city, who is control, who, who is, um, uh, you know, who should define the solutions and so on. And the essence of the argument is really clearly the national government in the case has the sort of authority to define the bigger rule system, but the local authority and the local community has more legitimacy in implementing the solutions to let's say the problems that we may have and so the argument within uh, something called the global parliament of mayors for example which i'm on the advisory board of is that there should be a new relationship contract between the state and the city and giving the city more power and more resources because you know as we well know if you've got garbage in the street, the city will have to deal with it. It's not the government. That's a stupid example. But do you see what I'm saying? So in short, the local authority has a vital role. I mean, it should have a bigger role. OK, let me um, uh, go back to the national uh, uh, level then. Uh, you know that uh, we just had this climate uh, summit. And then the, we are also facing currently, you know, energy crisis in, in many countries. And of course, you know, the two are related. <laughs> so what would you suggest, you know, from the viewpoint of creative bureaucracy to deal with this issue? Yeah, I mean, there are some, some issues uh, that are out of the control of us as individuals, as individuals as cities or states, as, as we know, the bigger supply chain issue uh, problems that are happening to do with, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, from the point of view of the, the, the bureaucracy, what we're always trying, what we need is models of that planet B we're trying to create. Now, obviously we need to get planet A right, but from the point of view of really trying to find places, I'll give an example of Amsterdam. Many of you in the room will know about Kate Rayworth's donut economics. Amsterdam, and what that basically means is one planet living. Amsterdam has taken that so seriously and has about, has a whole team of people working on it. They've got, 220 or something large and small projects on that. So what it's trying to be is a model of something. Now, once we've got a model, and that means changing the, 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 uh, the rules and regulations and incentives and providing incentives, if you can see something, 
as a model, then then you're more likely to follow it. I mean, people copy Copenhagen. There's even a word now, Copenhagenize a city. Um, so we need models of, of small places and big places. I mean, I'm always aware when one's talking to Asia, the, you know, a small place for you may be a big place for me, <laughs> if you know what I mean. But nevertheless, I think that that's w where we need to go. Generating models, what the creative bureaucracy tries to do is celebrate those people who are trying to do that. Now, um, you mentioned in your lecture that you're doing something for the city of Favara. Is that correct? Uh, well, is it, isn't it Italy? Yeah, or, I mean, it, it, it is in Italy. Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm I'm connected to them, and I'm trying to help them in 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 a bit. Yes. Well, I'm just, I bring bring this up because we have a colleague from Italy who might who might want to. <laughs> you you have anything you want to comment on Favara or? Anything? He might not know Favara. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right, yeah. Yeah, never mind, never mind, yeah. So, um, we still have about 10 minutes before uh, Charles has to uh, go to another meeting. He's a very busy uh, person. In fact, you know, we try to really schedule this talk uh, among his very many commitments. <laughs> now, um, let me then try to fill up, you know, this gap uh, when others are thinking about the, the question. Professor Tam, um, can you hand the microphone to Professor Tam? You can just sit in your seat. The, the camera uh, would, would I, turn around. Um, I have, a, you, you have given many examples about Berlin. Uh, I've been to Berlin many times, so I'm very interested in, uh, in Berlin. Um, every time I go there, I would compare East Berlin with West Berlin in terms of development after the Second World War. And I will also uh, visit Potsdam and think about history, the role of history in the division of Berlin into the East and the West and the cultural developments there afterwards. Apparently there was a lot of planning in East Berlin um, before the collapse of the uh, the war, but then uh, we find that West Berlin is more vibrant than East Berlin. <laughs> so planning, it depends on how we, whether there's good planning or bad planning and how planning will affect the development of culture or less government interference, less intervention would be a better thing. So um, in terms of the con your concept of planning culturally or cultural planning, how would you look at the difference in East Berlin and West Berlin in terms of cultural development? Well, I mean, the reason I showed some examples of Berlin is because I was a fellow at something called the Robert Bosch Academy. So I, uh, and, and my parents were German, so I speak fluent German. So I was living in Berlin. So that's the reason I was showing that. Um, uh, well, look, as you well know, when the wall fell, it was the biggest marketing coup any city in the world could ha ever have, that wall falling, because it was so symbolic. But um, uh, the, 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 the East Berlin was very rigid planning, as you well know. And it's that intermediary zone, once the wall fell, the slightly declining places on the other side in East Berlin and at the border of West Berlin, what was the centre of what then became what we consider to be the vibrant Berlin. There's, of course, the magisterial Unter den Linden with the big institutions as well and Brandenburg and Gate and so on. But um, it's, it's that what happened was that zone, it's quite a big zone, probably a kilometer wide all across the city, was uncertain. And in that uncertainty, also about ownerships, 
that's when lots of people came in and initially perhaps tried to occupy places and stuff like that. This was then legalized and so on. But it's that zone that really became partly the area where what we consider to have a creative things. Um, so my general answer to you is to be more open than closed, more enabling as a, as a planning authority, more to say, the key slogan of the creative bureaucracy is, how do you move from a no because to a yes if culture? So I'm more in, 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 in that direction, but I'm not a person who's saying you have a complete free for all and let everything go and so on. Um, so it's it's a bit about orchestrating. I use that word curating. You have to curate environments, being aware of the hard stuff and, and, and the soft stuff. And what's particularly interesting to me is when we say creativity, there's a lot of creativity, for example, happening in universities, but physically you can't you don't know it may be there. I mean, I was uh, at the beginning of this week in in one of the main European centres which studies the ocean. Yeah, uh, an incredible institution. But you got you had no idea what was happening in this building where a thousand people worked. So there is creativity, different forms of creativity, and it's a real challenge for us, the citizen, to understand where it is, which is why the city is really a canvas and needs to be rethought that it is finding ways to show what I call making the invisible visible, because otherwise all you see is a shopping centre and some shopping centres are nice and some are boring. Okay, we have a question from our guest, uh, uh, Mr. Alex Law. Hello, uh, Professor. Um, my question is, how pa pandemic is going to help Hong Kong in, in the future? As, you, as I uh, heard from you, the word um, curiosity, how the connectivity and connection to creativity. Uh, in Hong Kong, really, to me, the word vernacular is almost lost. We don't have a street, as you shown in your slides. Uh, your slides, we do have a curving street, flamboyant street, but those streets are losing the values. Uh, we, we, are, we have high rise, uh, which, which are all, all right, but, but we are losing. We, we have some uh, pressings, have some uh, neighborhoods, you, you have that word very, very sharp. And I remember it well, neighborhood. We, we are losing a neighborhood. Uh, we are building, we are rebuilding, we are rebuilding met metropolis. We even, we are doing metropolis. But I see, I, I, to me, I see the values in what you are seeing, talk, talking about pandemic. Is it going to change the direction? We are going to, Megapolis, Metropolis, but where are we in our ruins? Uh, the Notre Dame church was burned. It's going to be rebuilt, I, I, I believe. Uh, yes, my question. Well, the, the meeting I've got to go to in a minute, in, in five minutes or three minutes, is uh, to be on the jury of the Human City Design Award coming out of Seoul. So what you're talking about is the human city. Uh, the pandemic, it, it only will have an effect if one can get the people who develop the city, the property developers and others to understand about this question of the human scale, the human being at the center of, of city development. I think attention has focused more on the human being and particularly the way buildings and structures face the street and public space and, and so on. But the general dynamic, of course, is in the opposite direction of what you're talking about. Um, but this is why, I mean, the UN now talks about the human-centered city, is that's really, we have to put these sort of words at the center of, of our city making, rather than talking about urban development, we should always be having perhaps the word human being 
at the centre of it. I know that's a very short answer. It's partly because I've got to be in this meeting in two minutes now. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. I think uh, I'll let you go uh, with my last, uh, maybe a rhetorical question, right? You don't have to answer it. Um, and also is relevant to the pandemic because at the moment, I think there are two approaches of countries tackling the issue. One is something like uh, what we're doing in Hong Kong and China, very strict, very uh, uh, preventive. But the other, like uh, in the UK, in the US and, and many countries, they choose to live with the virus. So which approach you think is more creative? Uh, I, I, I don't think the word creativity comes here. Both, both uh, people are trying to work out a solution. I mean, I think actually, because I've just been to, uh, to, 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 to Europe a few times, I actually think one should be a bit more restrictive. I mean, in the end, we uh, pandemics tend to become endemic, endemic, hopefully they don't kill you on the way, and, and we will have to live with the virus. But I mean, for example, having masks in public transport, the other day I was in London, only 50% of people had a mask. I thought it was stupid. So I'm more about, you know, a bit more in your direction, Desmond. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that really reflects, you know, the, your spirit of creative bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck with your next meeting and we thank you once again thanks a lot for a wonderful talk thank you it was great being with you hope to yes. see you in real life we'll soon. Up, uh, very soon yeah thank you okay bye. You. bye 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 bye